Hello everyone, welcome to PwC Tax Byte podcast series. My name is Pieter Dree and I'm extremely happy that I can welcome um, Bart Weens and Tom Wallen to my uh, recording studio. Um, well, today we're going to talk about yeah energy crisis and impact on our business, but what can be done there and what is available for you as a business in terms of grants and incentives. Yeah? And, and to talk about this topic, I invited uh, Bart Weens, who is a senior uh, managing our team, he has uh, a large experience in, in, in support and subsidies for innovative uh, processes, research and development on all regions, regional uh, aid, but also on the European uh, side. And uh, with Bart, we also have uh, Tom Wallein. Tom is a senior expert in our team, uh, working more on the tax side of these incentives. And, and as we all know, there is a lot of things happening in the tax scene as well on this. Um, yeah. I don't think I need to give a lot of context to why we have this podcast. We come out of a period, luckily, which is behind us now on, on the pandemic um, uh, situation. A lot of disruptions there, a lot of need for support for businesses, uh, lots of impact on the people, uh, business continuity. And well, we come out of this crisis. We just enter uh, uh, in, in, into a new year. And there is then the energy crisis as from 2021. Um, tremendous impact on all of this. Businesses struggling with um, yeah, changing supply chain, uh, changing their dependency on certain energy sources like gas, etc., fossil fuels. Um, a transition is needed to a more green, more sustainable uh, economy based on more sustainable sources of energy. And against this uh, yeah, tremendous uh, development, and the question is, of course, um, yeah, for businesses, well, is there any support? Is there any help we can get in making that transition? And that is exactly what I want to talk about with uh, with Bart and Tom here today. So welcome, Bart. Welcome, Tom. Um, and we're going to start, um, yeah, our discussion, I think, uh, uh, with you, Bart, because, um, yeah, as an introduction, perhaps you can explain a little bit how Europe has responded to these uh, energy prices and, and the developments around that. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Also uh, very welcome on uh, my behalf. Uh, well, to answer the question, uh, at first we have the Repower EU plan. Uh, so this is a plan that was released uh, a year ago, let's say, uh, in May, I thought. In response to the what you say, uh, the energy market disruptions, uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine and everything that's, uh, that's linked to that. Now, um, what is the plan about? It's about existing initiatives uh, such as uh, maybe, you know, the recovery and resilience facility, which was the largest fund as a result of the COVID pandemic. And so part of that fund will be used uh, to, let's say, remediate the impact of the energy crisis. Um, and it also increased the uh, renewable energy target from the proposed Fit for 55 uh, package. The latter one, uh, for those uh, who need some additional uh, clarification on that, it refers to the EU target uh, on uh, the reducing or reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% in 20, uh, 2030. So what is the plan about? So the plan is about accelerating uh, the energy transition. This is a very important keyword. We'll get back to that uh, uh, in uh, several uh, several times during this uh, during this podcast and how does it do that well to uh, they offer a kind of yeah set of actions uh, to well the easiest way to save energy had uh, the most cost efficient way uh, but to also diverse uh, diversify our supplies uh, and substitution of fossil fuels by uh, again uh, accelerating Europe's clean uh, energy transition on top of or on top of smartly combining uh, investments and uh, reforms. Uh, I'll get back to that uh, later on. Um, if we look at our industry sectors, what we see there, there is a big push towards uh, electrification. Uh, so machines, productions, investments, uh, they are pushed as much as possible towards the use of electricity as energy source rather than fossil fuels. Um, and also, and I would say maybe finally, uh, the EU is also looking into uh, alternative energy sources. Many of you probably heard already about the hydrogen strategy. Well, hydrogen is one of those uh, alternatives to uh, to fossil fuels, the, the use of fossil fuels. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Olga, for that context. And, um... Um, yeah, looking at this, so yeah, repowering uh, Europe, a lot of initiatives. Uh, then, of, obviously, as an economist, I ask myself the question: 
uh, is how will Europe think of funding this transition to the clear energy uh, uh, future? Can you can you explain a bit on that, please? Yeah, sure. So um, there are a lot of incentives available. Huh? Uh, I'm not going to give a list of all that there is available because this would uh, take us a, a bit too long, I think, in this podcast. But maybe the most uh, the most important ones. Um, to get back to the Repower EU plan, I told about smart investments uh, that are foreseen. Well, one of such uh, examples of smart investment is CEF funding. CEF funding, CEF uh, standing for Connecting Europe Facility. Uh, it supports projects for infrastructure, uh, and it does that in three different areas. Uh, the first one is telecom, then you have digital, uh, transport, and then you have energy, which is very important, uh, very important. Now, CEF for Energy itself, what does it do? Well, it supports investments uh, in building new, let's say, cross-border energy infrastructure uh, in the different countries within Europe, um, or it upgrades existing uh, energy infrastructure to make sure that all uh, member states are connected and can make use of and is guaranteed of uh, the energy uh, that it needs to to be able to yeah let's say to to operate their business and uh, and the households um, that's the first one so that's the SAF implication it's European funding second one is the life program so the life program itself itself is actually use yeah funding instrument for environment and climate action uh, with life you have one specific area of focus and that's clean energy transition and so again this words uh, this word comes uh, popping up now what does it do uh, it funds coordination and supporting actions uh, across europe uh, and examples of that for coordination and, and support are the involvement and the empowerment of citizens for instance in the clean energy transition or uh, private finance that is attracted uh, to companies uh, for uh, investments in sustainable sustainable energy uh, basically those are the two most important ones uh, maybe the ones which are uh, less well known uh, that's the innovation fund so the innovation fund itself it's about uh, financing greenhouse gas reduction uh, projects so it's focusing really on r d while CEF is focusing on infrastructure uh, innovation fund is focusing on really r d and then finally you have yeah or i would say the most uh, prestigious flagship fund of the eu the horizon europe uh, program and that program is a multi-annual program with quite a large budget it runs until 2027 uh, budget more or less 90 billion uh, euros and within that program there is a lot of attention uh, concerning climate uh, and energy and energy transition but also that is primarily R&D. Yeah, thanks a lot. So it seems like a lot of, um, yeah, funding is also available at European level, clearly. Yeah, you, you explained all that, important amounts you mentioned. Uh, just a, a quick question. Do you think that, that that businesses are sufficiently aware at this moment? Do they really use these, these funds sufficiently in your view? Or, or are there lost opportunities here? Well, to be honest, I don't think businesses are, let's say, well advised on the fact that there is a lot of funding available on a European level. Uh, the flagship program, Horizon Europe, everybody knows about that. Huh? Uh, but the other types of funding, this is yeah something which uh, clearly deserves more attention, I would say, because also there, there are big numbers, uh, big projects, a lot of funding, uh, funding available. And secondly, what we also see, uh, Peter, is that uh, many companies, uh, they know about the regional funding, but they think European funding, that's not for me uh, because it's too big, it's too complex, et cetera, et cetera. While it's actually the other way, uh, the other way around, or at least it's not something that you have to be uh, scared of, I would say. Uh, it's also something for your company, uh, you could be eligible uh, as well, especially if you think about collaborating with other parties. Okay, well, thanks, Martin. I think that's already one thing I, I'm noting down here because at the end of this podcast, I tried to give conclusions. I can already anticipate that one of my conclusions will be think about European funding as well. You mentioned regional funding and you talked about Europe. So also at regional level, obviously, there must be sources of funding available. Can you also elaborate a little bit on that, uh, Martin? 
Certainly, certainly. Uh, regional funding, as the name says, of course, uh, it's uh, depending on the country uh, where you where you live in. Uh, the incentives available in uh, the Netherlands are not the same as in Belgium or not the same as in the UK. In Belgium, uh, it's a bit more difficult and we make it a bit more difficult in the sense that uh, the governments, the regional governments are the ones responsible for handing out the funding. So there is a difference between Flanders, Brussels capital region and uh, the Walloon port. Now, more or less, uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, if we see what happens on European level, we can also see the same evolution on regional level. Huh? So also here we will see uh, or we see that there is a lot of focus on uh, ecology, sustainability, cir uh, circular economy, etc., etc. Now, what funding is available? That depends a little bit. On the one hand, you have existing programs uh, which are exploited. Uh, let's say, uh, for instance, if I give an example in Flanders, you have the Ecology Premium Plus that uh, gives you a premium depending on the investment that you make. And if you, let's say, don't use fossil fuels for your truck, uh, but use uh, another type of energy source, this can get funded uh, via such a premium. Or on the other hand, and this is what is a very positive evolution. Um, there are increasingly new funding programs which are made available, which come available. Uh, also, just to give you uh, an overview, uh, on the one hand, you have everything focusing on R&D linked to the energy transition. Here we are again, uh, which is a fund in Flanders uh, and also for the federal government uh, and economy. Um, we also have uh, investments in large-scale PV energy, uh, let's say, creation or energy uh, investments which are linked to renewables. Uh, and we also have, uh, for instance, uh, projects which are investing in residual heat, solar panels, windmills, uh, etc., etc. So there is, while there is a lot in the EU level, uh, there is a lot also on the regional level. So this is definitely something also to take a look at outside of the traditional, I would say, uh, funding programs that currently uh, currently exist. Yeah, I imagine the, the, the funding programs must be quite new for some enterprises, for some businesses eh, who perhaps in the past did not yet uh, obtain subsidies, but now start to do that green transition, energy transition, and, and may not may overlook uh, potentially the, the vast opportunities. Um, does the one level exclude the other in practice or, or are often three levels combined? No, that's a good question. No, it doesn't. So typically uh, what you have to be aware of, of course, uh, is that if you ask funding for a specific project uh, project on a regional level, that you cannot uh, ask for funding for exactly the same project on the European level. So let's say double funding is uh, in, in many cases almost always not, uh, not allowed. But uh, what we do see is that parts of a project can be funded regionally and other parts can be funded in collaboration, for instance, with other companies on a European level. Uh, also, there is a difference if you look at uh, the Energy Transition Fund, which is R&D uh, focused. Uh, this is so on the regional level, but then on the European level, you have the demonstration of such technology. And so that is all something that uh, that can be combined. So there is no need to, let's say, skip EU funding because you already had regional funding or the other way around. So this is uh, this is indeed a good question, Peter. Yeah, good, good to know and for the audience to know, obviously. Um, and then, yeah, OK, um, subsidies, direct funding is, is very attractive, of course. Uh, but are there also other ways of funding green transition? Uh, but you may want to share something on that. For the audience yes indeed yeah. so there are uh, if you look at uh, or if you heard about uh, the invest eu program so invest eu is actually uh, a fund a very very large uh, fund that specifically targets everything concerning sustainability energy uh, the circular economy water waste etc etc uh, it is partially funded by the european investment bank uh, which was recently in the news as this will be a eu investment or climate uh, bank in the in the future so just to 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 show you that it's a really important uh, important team 
Um, now to have such funding in practice, then you have to take, well, let's say, look at regional uh, partners of that uh, of that EU Invest program, which then help you asking for funding uh, from that fund. Yeah, thanks, Bart, for uh, for that. And now I think um, I think that was a very good overview of different funding opportunities. I hope that that the audience uh, is triggered by that and 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 is is now exploring uh, the, the the vast amount of opportunities that are out there. Um, Tom, I'm going to ask you in a minute about what uh, if there anything from a tax side that could further help this energy transition. But before I do that, uh, another question, Tom. Uh, so if you are um, successful in obtaining this funding and this 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 grants. Uh, does does generally the, the 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 authorities take then their share by taxing that, or uh, how does that look from a tax perspective? Well, that's that's a very good question, Peter. And and of course, it would be a pity that if companies receive a grant, that immediately they would be taxed on that. Um, and it's it's not such a straightforward question um, because in in Belgium, um, grants, as mentioned by Bart. Um, are issued by by the regional level, so are given by the regional level, and for certain of those grants, there's indeed a tax exemption from a tax perspective. Um, for the most European grants, which are directly uh, provided for by by European money and and by European institution, those grants will be taxed. So that's the downside for for the European grants. Unfortunately, there is no list available. Uh, of the grants that are, um, let's say, given by Belgian institutions, whether or not they are exempt from Belgium corporate tax. So it has to be analyzed ground per ground whether or not uh, they are available for such uh, tax exemption. Yeah, well, I think that's that's a side note, I think, for the audience. So if you are confronted with grants, do check the tax treatment because there could be an opportunity there to exempt that, that uh, income and, and even uh, increase the benefit. Eh? But Okay, let's move to the to the to the tax incentives because I guess uh, the tax system has always been used to push a little bit the behavior uh, of of taxpayers. Is that the same for uh, for this topic, Tom? But that's indeed the same for this topic, uh, Peter. If we if we compare Belgium uh, with the surrounding countries, we are doing actually pretty good, uh, not to say outstanding in that respect. Um, first of all, I, I also want to make the remark that uh, the fact that you get a subsidy uh, does not mean that you cannot uh, get a, a tax incentive for the same investment that you make, be it the CAPEX investment, be it an investment in, in research and development. Uh, so that's not an issue at all. Furthermore, you can also combine various tax incentives. Eh? So uh, it is not because you have the tax credit that, for instance, you would not be able to claim the patent box here in Belgium. Um, now, what do we have in Belgium? Well, m for me, we have mainly three three topicals uh, that can be very important in this respect. First of all, uh, when we develop, when companies develop new uh, technologies, green technologies, for instance, there is the tax credit for qualifying research and development activities. Uh, uh, this can be applied certainly for new sustainable technologies and, and investment. Uh, the tax credit um, gives a benefit of let's say five five percent net return on the investment that you make um, and it's also refundable so that means if you have a startup uh, that wants to invest in a new technology and it does research and development for that even though that startup does not pay any tax it will get a refund for from the belgian tax authorities so that's in fact a very powerful tax credit that we have here in belgium um, a second one is that we have the energy investment deduction. And if you do, if you make CAPEX investments and qualifying investments, such as energy savings investment, such as new technologies, solar panels, green uh, technologies and whatsoever, you will get again uh, a tax deduction from the Belgian tax authorities. Uh, and this results in a 3% net return on the investments made. As mentioned, both the tax credit for research and development and the energy investment deduction uh, can be combined. Now, the good news is that um, the Belgian government is also aware of all those new developments. So now we have in the tax code a fairly old list of elements of, of investments that qualify for both incentives. And the, 
the Belgian government makes itself strong that it is working on a revised list whereby we would take into account all those new green technologies, all those sustainable energy sources and so on, so that we could come to a new list that hopefully will be broader than the existing list and hopefully that also will be tailored to what companies do need to invest in nowadays. So we are very much looking forward to that new in investment list, which would enter into force uh, in the course of 2024. And of course, um, if we don't look at the, the cost side of things, but uh, at the input, uh, at the output side of things, um, for instance, when companies develop new technologies, it is also the purpose that they want to commercialize uh, th those new technologies. So if you have a patent for that new technology, of course, we still have the patent income deduction in Belgium. And the patent income deduction is, again, a very powerful instrument because uh, it will provide for a fairly low effective tax rate on the revenues that are attached to those new and green technologies. So also in that respect, uh, it is very beneficial for Belgium companies to, to help uh, to help the environment uh, and to invest in, in newer green and sustainable technologies going forward. Um, there's one remark I want to make with respect to the patent box, and that's of course we will have pillar two uh, that will come into force in the coming years. Uh, so for companies that are subject to pillar two, so meaning being part of a group exceeding uh, with a revenue exceeding seven hundred and fifty million dollars, the impact on the patent boxes will will have to be observed, obviously. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. And then I guess whatever you, you you explained us very clearly on Belgium is actually similar for a lot of countries. So I would say if people in the audience uh, are doing projects in other countries in Belgium give a call to Tom because he has a pretty good view on, on what's happening in other countries as well uh, in the tax side. Unfortunately, that's still very unharmonized, unharmonized and you need to look country per country, uh, of course. Yeah, and I think um, uh, with Pillar 2 uh, coming around, uh, Bart, whatever you explained on direct uh, subsidies is going to be yeah more important than ever because those are, of course, uh, not covered and not captured by Pillar 2, so making them uh, more sustainable, I think, uh, in terms of funding your projects in the long term. Um, okay, I think with that, I think we, we, we had a very good discussion, I think, on on, on the lot of incentives and opportunity, there's the opportunities that there are available for the green transition. Um, if you could give like um, one key message to the audience in, in when, when they are looking into projects for green transition, what would that key message be? Um, but what would your message be? Well, actually, the most important one, uh, if we look at grants, uh, those are project-based funding. Yeah? So that means that you first have to define a project where you go to the regional government or the EU, there you defend it, and then it gets approved, and then you can start uh, investing. So this is a very, very important, uh, very important remark. Don't start investing uh, and handing out a lot of money to to make sure uh, that that you achieve what you want to achieve. But first, define the project. First, go to the uh, funding government, and only then start uh, start working. That's a very important one. Thanks, Bart. Indeed, very important. Tom. Yeah, I have also one, Peter. Um, what I incur the most in my practice is that if we talk about techno new technologies inventions, that the people that do the invention often do not see that they do such a big invention because they say, well, it's in the normal course of my work. I would say for me, it's very important um, to make the inventor aware that what he's doing is really crucial and indeed is an invention, although it may take only a few hours of work. Also a very important one. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for this uh, interesting discussion. I would say to the audience, thank you very much for tuning into my uh, podcast series and I hope to see you again in the uh, next one. Thank you. Have a great day.